same potentiality I have in me, it's part of a cosmic potentiality. It can actualize. The empirical world actualizes. Science can only make experiments on the empirical world. It can only guess on what is going on elsewhere. But the guesses cannot be stupid because they have to be in agreement with how this world interacts with. Don't get me started on that. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to follow up on uh, both John and Walter's uh, points. Um, taking what John um, said a little while ago, I would also prescribe to the view that uh, we have to keep uh, the great strengths of science. We're not going to throw some, the baby out with the uh, window along with the water. Uh, so the empirical side of science is, has worked for us mar marvelously. Actually, it's not even 400 years. It goes back all the way to Aristotle and to Archimedes and even, maybe even before to the, the yeah, those Dr Greeks. <laughs> and probably also, probably also some of the ancient Indian cultures, but uh, we don't have as much as many records perhaps or not translated into English as much. Uh, but in any case, um, so the empirical side is very, very, very important. Um, at the same time, uh, we have to realize that it cannot be the complete picture. So, um, yes, uh, we will keep the empirical side. And my, uh, my own view, uh, my own uh, little uh, perhaps stepping forward in terms of this f uh, science of the future is what I have been uh, proposing for the last couple of years to push as much as possible um, science using mathematics. Um, uh, to the level, what John was saying before, where emerging occurs. Uh, last night I talked about the five levels, so the five pure levels, and then Maya sets in. To push it all the way to that level, uh, where the, still the object, subject, uh, complementarity exists. And then, uh, I think, in order to go that far, we have to push as much as we can mathematics, because it is really mathematics that is a language that we use to interact with nature. Um, in terms of what Lothar was saying, it's again a very important point, and actually Niels Bohr, as we all know, um, pointed out very, very carefully, and he himself sometimes was not understood, he would not make sense, and he joked about it, he said, yeah, you know, I'm not very precise, because I have to deal with this quantum uh, world. And of course that is the importance of the words that we use, and um, um, as Lothar said, uh, for example, in German, there's two words for realism. Um, there are other cultures where the idea of an external world doesn't really exist, uh, or the idea of time moving forward in direction does not exist. They, in the aborigines of Australia, they call it dream time. They have a dream time where uh, the uh, locals can uh, go into that uh, halfway between dream and waking state, and they can find their way through the deserts of, uh, desert of Australia, which of course, as you know, is a vast desert, and get to the point. So that is perhaps the omega point, that's the tele teleological point, which is driven by biolo what I call biological aims. And they can get there because, and we heard this, this morning, some beautiful discussion from the biological side, it's really the last point that drives the whole thing. But not to belabor the point too much, it is the language that um, can bind us. And uh, we take language um, as absolute, um, and now it's the English language because that's the language, the international language, but we have to be a little bit careful. Coming from Greek myself, I, I know there are other rich languages and we shouldn't just be attached to the English language because that will really split us perhaps into one point of view. Uh, so, again, the ancient Rishis were talking about the origin of the alphabet. Patanjali was a great philosopher, but also was a, a great um, dialectician and also uh, uh, founded the, uh, like um, um, uh, some of the modern uh, linguists, he founded uh, linguistics. So, uh, the, the Madrika Shakti, or the power of the letters, and hearing the letters is very important, and it's the one that binds us to our concepts, and then we we believe that those concepts are the reality, but that's not reality; it's only our concepts. So, um, uh, one more from me, and then we'll open it up. And 
in a fairly sort of concise way, we'll start with you, Menas. Um, this section I would call, well, what does it all mean to me? You know, how does this understanding that comes to us all the way from quantum physics, it seems very esoteric. I seem to live in a Newtonian world. Somehow it's all cause and effect, but um, what we've learned, how will this change the way I live my life, how I real experience my own reality and existence, you know, the deepest possible level. What am I going to get from this? I will say that we live in a quantum world. We don't live in a Newtonian world. It just appears to be a Newtonian world um, because of some approximations and some accidents, quote unquote, of nature, such as the regularity of the uh, motions of the planets, things like that. Um, it is a very much a quantum world. Um, the question is not uh, why is it quantum world. The question is why is the human mind take it to be a, a classical world when it is a quantum world? That is really the, the question. Um, and that has probably has something to do with the, the mind. It probably has to do with the brain, I should say, and the physiological structure of the brain. And that's actually where neuroscience can come in and uh, help us a lot. Uh, however, I would, um, I would um, say that if that's the case, we, the biologists and the neuroscientists have to adopt quantum theory. They shouldn't just say, oh, that applies at the nano level, but not anywhere else. They should give up the idea. And unfortunately, the physicists that are are really telling them otherwise. Um, for me personally, um, I have fun with quantum theory. I, I'm, I'm not just a quantum physicist, I do other things. I'm also an artist and I love art and uh, music. So I don't really feel that uh, we have to just be scientists. Um, I prefer the term natural philosopher. Uh, and I, I'll come back to that. I think uh, Newton and the, at the time of Newton, they had it right because it's, it is philosophy that has to do with the natural world. Science now it has been identified with materialism, and I think that is a mistake. Uh, the natural philosophy allows the other parts of um, philosophy to come into. Thank you. <clears throat> I mentioned this uh, second German word, being real, it can act on you. It's not an accident that quantum theory came out of this German language realm. It's a, it's a form of idealism. Something that is not material can act on you. What does it mean for us? That is a very good question. If it doesn't mean anything, why don't we all go have a beer or something? Um, can, we can do that too. <laughs> the logical consequence of, of Newton's materialism and mechanism is Darwin. It's, it's wonderfully logical. It means you are a machine. It means you don't have any values. You just have selfish genes that use you as their, their machines to pursue their purposes. You are nothing. In a quantum world, where a world is wholeness, we can have a meaning. In a quantum world, we can have a spiritual view of the world, and it is not in conflict with a scientific view. In 1900, you could not have believed in science, have a religious faith, and be logically consistent. Today, you can believe in science and have a spiritual view of the world, and there's nothing stupid about it. <laughs> it, it suggests, well, <laughs> Darwinian virtues are aggression, selfishness. We cannot live like, it's a disaster. We cannot live like this anymore in a globalizing world. It is not an accident that physics discovers wholeness in the universe when the world is globalizing at the same time. We need something new. That's why, I'm sorry, use as a title of my talk. There's a mutation of our consciousness to wholeness, to working together, to be together, to why do we have to have a society based on aggression and competition? Why not try one based on cooperation and support? This is, the meaning is classical science and being a useless machine that came about by dicing together some debris in the universe, <laughs> or being the result of a potentially meaningful process. 
The universe has a potential and we are its expression. We have a cosmic function. Beautiful, thank you. Lothar. Really beautiful. <laughs> It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, it was you. <laughs> Take really? a bow, come on. <laughs> Following upon that, I think, <laughs> and related to it, for me, the, the critical discovery is the scientific discovery, scientific rediscovery of higher states of consciousness, beginning with the meditative state, beginning with Turiya, beginning with Samadhi as something real, not something imaginary, fanciful, or mystical, but something that is easily accessible, easily accessible by anyone. And higher states of consciousness, which are just further stages of awakening of the experience of the self, from transcendental, ultimately, to everything. These higher states of consciousness unlock the treasury, they open the door to the full capacity of human mind and full capability of brain functioning. And when you think about the fact that we're living in a 5% world where people are using 5% maybe, although I think that's optimistic, generous, 5% of the innate capability of the human brain to accessing and utilizing the total brain and you can see it electrophysiologically in the EEG, in the MEG, in the fMRI, in PET and inspect, utilizing the entire brain, bringing one's entire resources to bear on every experience. This is important. Um, living, breathing the unity of life, actualizing the scientific truth of the unity of life as a living reality in daily life in higher states of consciousness, which are our birthright. Our brain was specifically engineered to live wholeness and unity, designed for it. We have the cosmic hardware. We tend to be missing the software, the instructions on how to access this cosmic hardware. That's the fall of education, and that's starting to change. It's a baby step, but now the, the David Lynch Foundation that I've been very happy to be associated with is bringing into the public school system in the US and more and more countries throughout the world, transcending as part of the curriculum, part of the academic day, taking 10 or 15, 20 minutes away from book learning to actually develop the full potential of the knower, maximal expansion of human consciousness. And that is going to transform the world. Everyone living their full potential, where the unity of life and behavior motivated based upon the experience of the unity of everyone, unity of everything. That's a new, call it unified field-based world, a non-dual world, living Vedanta, an Advaita world. That's the world that's coming. And, and I mean, in our lifetime, we will see that total transformation at the pace that it is beginning to unfold. Beautiful. Thank you so much, John. Uh <laughs>